actually now it's um, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, uh, our first keynote. Um, Jeff is a, a well known to everyone, I assume, in the room. Certainly to me, um, uh, as a as a wavering economist back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, and and, ex and wanting to explore um, more. Well, I shouldn't say interesting lines of inquiry, but it seemed at the time that that was the case. It was a lot of the research that uh, uh, Jeff had, had, had been involved in at, the t at that time that was uh, somewhat inspirational for me. Um, he's one of the world's foremost thinkers on leadership, organisational theory and human resource management. Um, he's travelled to be here today from a long way away. Um, it's a short period of time you're here, Jeff, and I know you came in yesterday, so... Um, I hope that you'll uh, hit the ground running. I'm sure you will. Um, as a professor at uh, Stanford University, um, uh, for many years, he's a prodigious author, I think, authoring over 15 books and countless papers. I think at this stage you've probably stopped counting, so I won't, I won't try. Um, it's a great pleasure to have him here. Um, he's going to talk a bit about today the, uh, his recent book, Leadership BS, an acronym that I think needs no uh, <laughs> translation. Um, so let's please uh, join me in thanking or welcoming uh, Jeff Pfeffer to the stage. It is a pleasure to be with you all this morning, uh, to be back in Australia for the ninth time. What people in this room probably don't know is that uh, the founding dean of the Melbourne Business School, John Rose, was a dear and is a dear friend of mine. He is unfortunately, in Germany, where his wife is quite ill. Uh, but uh, he brought me here several times, uh, five times in the late, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And we saw all of Australia. And then I've been back three or four times since. So it's a, it is a pleasure to be back here. In the 1980s, late 80s, I think in a park, uh, John said to Kathleen and I that if we should move to Melbourne, uh, which we probably should have. Uh, unfortunately, we're now too old to do that. But uh, as I tell everybody, if I were 30 or 40 years younger, I would definitely leave the United States, which has got all kinds of wonderful issues, including apparently our president doesn't get along too well with your prime minister. <laughs> but some of you may have seen the skit on Saturday Night Live. If you haven't, you should. So I'm going to spend a relatively brief period of time talking to you about what the topic is. By the way, if you actually do a search a Google search under the term leadership BS, you come up with uh, people who offer bachelors of sciences in leadership. <laughs> so BS may not stand exactly for what you think it is, but in this case it does. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about fixing the leadership development process. And the premise of this talk is extremely, extremely simple. Um, number one, by any reasonable measure, and in fact by every measure, the leadership development process has failed and continues to fail, and fails profoundly by every possible measure, which we'll give you some data on, uh, including leaders are failing, leadership development is failing, including by the people running the programs. Uh, the, the Gallup surveys show uh, employee disengagement, low levels of job satisfaction, and this is true not just in the United States, but worldwide. And by the way, there is no in indication that any of these indicators are moving in a, in a better way. And so um, finally, I got like aggravated. One person gave one talk too many that kind of irritated me. So I decided to write Leadership BS, which was not the book I was writing at the time. The book I was writing at the time will come out in March. That's also a depressing book. It's called Dying for a Paycheck. And you can, <laughs> and you can probably guess what that book is about. That book, that book is about the workplace and human health, which, it, which again affects people all over the world, including in Australia, where the Australian Psychological Association estimates the cost of $15 billion to the Australian economy from workplace stress. Workplace stress is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. A million people a year are dying in China from overwork. But, but, but in the, before I could finish that, I had to write this book on leadership BS in an attempt which I hope we will succeed at doing, but I also am realistic in my <laughs> powers of persuasion to convince you that you need to do some things fundamentally different in your leadership development process. And, uh, and if you do that, we'll be on the road 
uh, to, I think, great things. But since most people don't want to change, everyone wants to change, but no one wants to do anything differently. This is another kind of practice. Then we'll continue on the same path that we're on, which is a pretty bad path. So I'm going to say a bunch of things. I mean, one of the things I tell people all the time is I'm old and I'm tenured, and the combination makes me extremely dangerous. <laughs> and, and my reputation is as a truth teller, and so I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth may oftentimes be uncomfortable. My favorite line, of course, is Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise and a, a few good men with the famous line, you can't handle the truth. I actually believe you can handle the truth. I think you need the truth. My premise is that to get from where we are to where we want to be, we need to acknowledge the current situation, which many people don't want to do because it's not good. Secondly, we need to diagnose why it exists. And we need to understand the objectives we seek and most importantly, appreciate the trade-offs and obstacles. Um, I've seen and gone to way too many leadership conferences where many people believe the job is to inspire you and make you feel good. Um, if this is how medicine was practiced, we use lots of nitrous oxide and laughing gas and other uh, kind of opioids, I guess we are using those, and, and use much less evidence. So I'm going to try to give you some evidence and some practical advice about what to do. This, of course, is the book. My, this, they made a rubber stamp to do the BS for the cover, and having finished with the rubber stamp, my editor said, you know, Jeffrey, we have this lovely BS stamp. Would you like it? <laughs> so I have it. They sent me the BS stamp with a red ink pad, which has made me extremely dangerous. Um, the first thing we need to acknowledge is that the leadership industry is enormous. There, if you, if you scholar.google.com, which is the scholarly literature, more than 3.85 million entries for the word leadership. 328 million results from a Google search, 226,000 entries on Amazon.com. Barbara Kellerman estimates $50 billion of spending. McKinsey estimates $14 billion just in the US. My estimate, based on extrapolating some data from the ASTD, is $20 billion. Every business school, every university, we are in the business of developing or educating leaders. Harvard Business School's motto, our job is to make to train leaders to make a difference in the world. However, workplaces are horrible. Low levels of employee engagement. Gallup, 142 country study, finds that almost twice as many people are actively disengaged as are engaged. Steadily declining levels of job satisfaction worldwide. High levels of workplace bullying and abuse. Some of you may know my dear friend and occasional co-author, Bob Sutton who in two, 10 years ago published the No Asshole Rule. Since the No Asshole Rule failed, this year he, published, he introduced his sequel, The Asshole Survival Guide. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see where we're going. There's lots of, lots of workplace bullying and abuse. Workplace bullying and abuse exact, exacts an enormous toll on the human being subject to it. No wonder it is the case that in a Parade Magazine survey conducted in 2012, gave US employees a choice. Would you rather have a substantial raise or fire your boss? 35% of the people said, I'd easily forego a substantial raise if I could get rid of the son of a gun who was supervising me. Leaders, by the way, are failing. Um, Ronald Clement, tracking the Fortune 100, found that by 2005, prior to the financial crisis, 40% of the Fortune 100 CEOs had engaged in Misconduct serious enough to draw national media attention. DDI survey of 1,300 people from around the world found that one third did not consider their own manager effective. William Gentry, who's gone to work, um, who's left the Center for Creative Leadership, did a wonderful review. And he said approximately, he summarized lots of research studies, including studies not done by CCL, and concluded that one half of all leaders and managers are ineffective in their current role. It's just, you know, this is, I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, leaders, by the way, lose their jobs. So we can see, number one, the workplace is, is miserable, and people think their, their leaders and managers are, for the most part, miserable. And they're subject to workplace and bullying and abuse. And leaders themselves are failing. The conference board documented a decline in CEO tenure. The consulting firm Booz in 2011 said 14% of the CEOs of the largest companies were fired. What's sad to me, and one of the reasons that is I teach my class that I teach at Stanford called the Paths to Power, 
is that my, my, my objective in the class, which I state basically on the first page, which nobody believes, is that my job is, 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 in the, is a consequence of this class that you never have to leave a position involuntarily. By the way, I am failing in that, but I continue to work at that. What is amazing, Stanford University is the most selective business school in the world. We have extremely talented people. Within the first two years of their graduation, approximately somewhere, and we've done this anecdotal rather than a survey, between 10 and 20% of these people will be fired. They're not going to turn over. They're going to be fired. When leadership BS was discussed in an alumni group at Washington, D.C., the alumni group set out, sent out a pre-meeting survey and asked the people, how many of you have suffered a, career, a severe career, career setback over the course of your career? And these, again, are extremely talented people highly selected, the answer was about 60%. So the, so the career devastation for us failing to do a good job in, 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 in getting people ready for the roles is not just workplaces are crummy, it's people are losing their jobs, and it's not good. By the way, leadership development is also failing. It turns out if you ask the people paying for leadership development, who, so by the way, have a bias, therefore, to say it's all great, how well is it doing? You will see that most of them find bad. Only 7% of senior managers polled by UK Business School thought their firms effectively developed global leaders. An Accenture survey found that only 8% of executives felt their company was effective in building leaders. A survey of a bunch of executives by the Institute for Corporate Productivity reported that even among the best, highest performing companies, 66% reported that they were ineffective at developing leaders and that they were getting worse at the process. So now we come to the causes and what you're going to do about it to fix it. What are the causes? Number one, if you wanted to, to have an effective intervention, you would probably hire people who knew what they were doing. The good news for you is that if someone in this room decides, this is a fabulous industry, $50 billion being spent in the US, God knows how much money being spent in Australia, New Zealand, all, all the world, I want to go into the leadership business. Congratulations, you're in the leadership business. There is absolutely nothing required. There is no credential required. There is no expertise required. You need to have never run an organization. It is not clear you have never needed to be in an organization. It is not clear you actually need to know what an organization is. <laughs> and I am not exaggerating. I, there is, so we hire, companies hire, universities, hi, not universities, associations hire, events like this hire people to come give talks on leadership. And in many instances, these people have absolutely no qualifications. So people say, Jeffrey, you are prone to exaggeration, which of course I am. So I decided one day to see if my exaggeration turned out to be true. So it's hard to get a list of like leadership gurus or whatever, but fortunately, Inc. Magazine in 2014 had a list of the 100 or 50 or some enormous number. I could only get through 20. Um, of the top leadership experts in the world and of the top 20 leadership experts in the world, only four had a PhD in a relevant field. One had no degree at all. Two had degrees in divinity, which by the way, since leadership is mostly about lay preaching and inspiration and getting people out of their seats and cheering and screaming and hollering, uh, that actually turns out to be quite a relevant degree if that's what your objective is. Five did not have degrees in business. And if you go to their websites, which I did assiduously, and say, what are you an expert in? You can guess. We are experts in talking. In 2014, having failed to take my own advice, which is, by the way, don't get old. Nothing good comes of it. <laughs> in 2014, I had to have lower back surgery. This year, I almost had to have upper back surgery, but they decided to pass on that. 2014, therefore, I had to go find somebody to do microsurgery on my lower spine. Let me assure you, and I found a guy who's like one of the top 20 in the United States, he's a fabulous human being. Trust me, when I looked at his expertise, I did not look at whether or not 
he could command the room, whether he could get people out cheering, whether his office furniture, which is, by the way, what you will find if you look at his rating on Yelp, whether his office furniture was modern, whether his phone system was up to date. If someone is doing microsurgery on your spine, you want to have only one question answered. Dr. Weber, which happens to be his name, in the past 30 years, exactly how many times have you had any complications at all? The answer was zero. Yes, it's one of the best in the world. You hire people for the relevant skills. And the relevant skills in the case of leadership development, let me suggest, which we're about to get to in a minute, is the skill to understand how to, in fact, develop effective leaders, which is quite different, as we'll soon see, from getting you to cheer and scream and holler and have some kind of ecstatic experience or whatever. You know, if you want ecstasy, go to a cathedral or <laughs> an organ recital or, or a great concert. This is not about what we should be doing. We should be fixing uh, leadership. But in any event, so we have people with no expertise. And then we measure them completely incorrectly. Because at the end of every at the end of every event, probably even at the end of this event, you will be giving, giving one of these little happy sheets to fill out. The famous happy sheet. Did you have a good time? Did you like it? Were you moved? Ah. If you read the first principle of the quality movement, management one, not management 101, 101 is already too advanced. Management one, you get what you measure. If I measure entertainment, I'm going to get entertainment. And so I highly recommend looking at YouTube videos on leadership. They are extremely entertaining. They're wonderful. However, almost no organization that I know of assesses leadership interventions by any of the things that are relevant to measure whether or not the leadership development program has worked. Notice, I did not begin my presentation by saying leadership development has failed because people have been insufficiently entertained. We talk about measures like employee engagement. Ah, if you're worried about employee engagement, maybe you ought to measure employee engagement and whether or not it got better. We talk about leaders losing their jobs. Maybe if we worried about leaders losing their jobs, we ought to measure. Do people go through these leadership development activities? Do better, do they keep their jobs? We do measure workplace bullying of use, job satisfaction, measure what matters. We know, because people have studied this, we don't know the correlation in groups like this, but we do know another correlation. In the early 1970s, there was an individual who got very interested in a relevant related topic to what we're talking about this minute, which is, he said, I wonder what the correlation is between instructor ratings and objective measures of student learning. Did it in calculus class? You want to know calculus, big sections, bunch of people randomly assigned to discussion sections. Everybody takes the same exam at the end. They've been randomly assigned to sections. What is the correlation between the section leader instructor ratings and the objective measures of learning as measured by people's performance on the exam? And everybody in this room can guess what the answer is. Zero. And since that time, there have been tons, that's a technical term, there have been many, many, many studies of the correlation between objective measures of learning and instructor rating. And the summary in 2009 of a meta-analysis said, the more, the better you measure objective learning, the closer that correlation gets to zero. It's not negative. It's not positive. It is zero. Now, if I said to you, I'm going to give you a lab test. The lab test is completely uncorrelated and has been shown this way for 40 years to be unrelated to any measure of, 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 of biological health or anything relevant, would you pay attention to that measure? The answer, of course, is no. But in this case, we do pay attention to the measure, which is interesting. So we're, number one, we're hiring people without expertise. Number two, we're evaluating them using measures which are, for the most part, 
irrelevant. There are some places where we do use relevant measures, but oftentimes we don't because we want people to have a good time. Third, there is conceptual imprecision. I'm not a big fan of authentic leadership. I don't think people ought to be authentic. Um, in the words of my dear friend Adam Grant, uh, unless you're Oprah, be yourself is bad advice. <laughs> he, he wrote a New York Times column with that title. <laughs> unless you're Oprah, be yourself is in fact bad advice. But I have friends who, who, who traffic in authentic leadership or charismatic leadership and various other kinds of leadership. If you do a Google search under the term authentic leadership, you should see what comes up, basically everything. If you do not measure things with precision, you cannot know what you're doing. One of the reasons why medicine is advanced and management hasn't is because medicine is very concerned about measurement and we aren't. So that's a third kind of cause of the issue. So there are some remedies, which I've already suggested. Number one, measure outcomes that matter. And I'm quite serious about this. This is not impossible to do. You can measure satisfaction, uh, employee engagement, bullying, turnover, the number of potential successors, leader effectiveness. Your interventions in leadership development should be related to something besides whether or not people have had a good time, whether or not they've you know, liked the donuts, whether or not they've been inspired or moved or whatever. Um, we, need to, we need to have criteria that are relevant to what we are trying to do. So somebody, I'll head this off immediately, somebody once said at one of these events, raised their hands and said, Professor Pfeffer. I said, yes. They said, you believe that instructor evaluations are undiagnostic of what people learn. I said, that's correct. They said, isn't it true? that Stanford requires every person to give out a course evaluation form to every student. And I said, absolutely. And they said, how do you jive the two things? And I said, it is actually simple. And I have executive coaches who work with my class, and they will attest that this is true. I said, I do not look at the evaluations. I do not look at the evaluations. He said, you don't look at the evaluations? I said, no, of course not. I said, it is, it is data. That, has, that, that is irrelevant to the measures we care about. I, I look at many other pieces of information, such as four or five years later, the people in my class, are they doing well? Have they succeeded? Have they gotten fired? If they haven't, we need to kind of go back and fix, see what we could do uh, to improve it. But I remain singularly focused on what my objective is. My objective is to make people successful in their careers, not to have them love me. Only one person needs to love me. She's in, named Kathleen. By the way, she's also the boss. I understand that also. <laughs> Number two, select experts, not entertainers, to do the scientific work of leadership evaluation and development. Now, get to the next part. Next part's tough. Trade-offs. One of the things that many people like to tell you is that you can have it all. Well, you know, the what is it, it's a Peter Pan, you're never going to grow old. Um, you know, but, but in fact, my criteria for leadership effectiveness, as opposed to my effectiveness, my effectiveness is making sure people can get things done and don't lose their jobs. Leadership effectiveness, leadership is about getting things done. It is not about winning a popularity contest. It is not about, you know, whatever. It is, it is about, you, you are hired into a leadership role in order to accomplish something, to bring a product to market, to sell something, uh, to, uh, to, to, to redo a manufacturing line or something. And life is often about trade-offs. So, you know, one of my favorites, there's an article in the New York Times where dishonesty is the best policy, US soccer falls short. This is a quote from that article, Americans bad at play acting, and if so, should they try to get better? Gamesmanship and embellishment are part of high-level soccer. Players exaggerate contact. They turn niggling knocks into something closer to grim death. And by the way, this is true for Christian Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. If you watch them play soccer, you know, you barely bump them, and oh, they're falling at the screen, and you're trying to draw the penalty flag. And the problem, apparently, with the US soccer team, in addition to many other problems, is that the US soccer people believe in sportsmanship. We will not act. <laughs> Trade-offs. You want to win the game or not? So. It's an interesting thought to think about. 
Most of the mo many of the most celebrated leaders engage in behaviors and use strategies and are willing to bet are completely out of side of what most leadership development programs teach. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. God knows we need him, but in any event, back. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln, do you know where the Southern delegation is? Go watch the movie, Lincoln. It's fabulous. Do you know where the Southern delegation is? No. Of course you know. Mr. Lincoln, are you willing to pass the constitutional amendment that abolished slavery in the United States? Are you willing to offer jobs to people who don't necessarily think are qualified for those jobs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great leaders are, first of all, pragmatists. Nelson Mandela, the father of South Africa, was at one moment a radical communist and the next uh, <laughs> willing to take up arms and the next minute a pacifist and the next minute this and the next minute that. And if you watch the famous movie, A Long Walk to Freedom, you can see his transition and his growth. Ronald Reagan was a pragmatist, Martin Luther King completely, Margaret Thatcher, absolutely. Trade-offs, ends versus means, my favorite article on the 500th anniversary of the publication of The Prince by Machiavelli, set aside what you would like to imagine. Machiavelli writes and instead goes straight to the truth of how things really work. In a world where so many are not good, you must learn to be able to not be good. The virtues taught are incompatible with the virtues one must practice to safeguard those institutions. The proper aim of a leader is to maintain his, her, state, and not incidentally their job. There are never easy choices. One of the problems that drives me nuts is people talk about, you know, do this and do that, and it's all going to be wonderful, and you're going to be, you can be nice and kind and generous, and everybody will love you, and everything's going to be fine. And, but life is, of course, about trade-offs. There is no drug that you will take that does not have a side effect. This is true for chemotherapy drugs. This is true for any kind of drug. It's true even for the 81 milligram aspirin I take every day to try to keep me functioning, such as it is. Every drug has a trade-off. Life is about trade-offs. We will advance in our study of leadership, and we will advance in our understanding and training of humans in leadership when we confront them with the trade-offs, as opposed to pretending that those trade-offs do not exist. Because then they hit the world, and you get experiences like the following. A woman calls me. I would like to get called by my students when things are going well, but mostly I get called when they're having troubles. She's on the phone. She's in tears. She's about to be fired. How did you get fired? Well, she said, I entered this organization, one of these high-tech, fancy organizations, and they told me that we were an organization that prided ourselves, our cultural values, were based upon openness, transparency, and honesty, that the only way people got better is by giving each other honest feedback, which is, by the way, empirically true. And so we were supposed to tell people when we saw them do something where we thought that they could improve in a constructive, nice way. And I have this boss. And the boss did something with me that I did not think was constructive or good and consistent with the organization's values. And so, believing in openness and transparency and authenticity and everything else, I told my boss what I thought. And now, of course, I'm gone. Well, I said, did you believe that? She said, yes, of course. Oof. So I, trade-offs. Trade-offs. We will get to the, the biggest trade-off soon when we talk about. Sometimes it is important to tell people not 100% the truth. Not 100% the truth. Does this outfit make me look heavy? The correct answer is no. <laughs> Do you love me as much as when we first met 33 years ago? The correct answer is yes. When your boss asks you, is this idea brilliant, unless your boss is flying the airplane into another airplane, the correct answer is, for the most part, smartest idea I ever heard.
Another problem, leadership training is inspiration. The Valeric Business School in Belgium website asks, looking for an inspiring management course. The Australian Graduate School of Management's website notes that the school creates inspirational learning opportunities. We're in the business of inspiring people. Go to the websites of law schools, medical schools, engineering schools, schools of architecture. Their job is, their job is to deliver professionally relevant, well-delivered material, not inspiration. I don't know, medical schools are like, my job is to inspire you. My job is to teach you the science and technique and practice of being a doctor. We believe inspiration is important. And because we believe inspiration is important, we tell inspiring stories, which, by the way, are almost with 100% the case not true. They can't be true. Number one, leaders are motivated to tell positive stories about themselves because we all like to self-enhance. So when you go to these view from the tops and these leaders, leaders, uh, leader stories speak and they will speak about how wonderful they are and all the things they've done, they will never tell you the, stab, the, the backs that they stabbed and the other things that they did to get to, get to their position. They're going to tell you inspiring stories, you're going to be inspired. But even if they wanted to tell you the truth, which by the way they don't, but even if they did, they can't. Because it turns out there's a lot of data on eyewitness accounts of accidents and crimes. So you're, an, I, you're a bystander. You have seen an accident. You've seen a crime. The cops come, and they say to you, what did you see? It turns out, even when you have no motive to recall incorrectly, and you are motivated to tell the truth, recall is imperfect. It turns out eyewitness accounts are remarkably unreliable. So if you can't tell the truth even when you're trying, you can picture how you could do when you're not trying. Studies in anthropology and psychology has found that self-deception has been found to be an adaptive trait. And after you tell a story often enough, you believe it. I believe at this stage that if you hooked him up to sodium pentothal, Donald Trump would actually tell you that his inauguration crowd was the largest in history. <laughs> you tell a story often enough, you believe it's true. So the stories, in our search for inspiration, we hear these stories. The stories, of course, aren't true. So then people get into trouble. Inspiration, by the way, is a very poor way to accomplish change. It raises motivation, but only for a short time. It sets unrealistic expectations for ourselves and others. And many of the inspiring stories we hear aren't true. And by the way, we know how to accomplish change. So if I said to you, if you came to me and said, Jeffrey, I'm drug addicted, or I'm an alcoholic, I need to stop drinking, taking drugs, or whatever. We would know what to do with you. We know how to accomplish behavioral change. Number one, you change the people that the people associate with. You change the network of social relations. Number two, you measure. Number three, you give people reminders. Number four, you give people incentives. If you go to some, you know, the 12-step programs for alcoholism, the smoking cessation programs, the programs to get people off of opioids and every other kind of uh, narcotic, none of them are based upon, here is somebody going to stand up and tell you how wonderful they did. You know, it is all going to be about change the people you associate with, change the cues that cues your behavior. We understand how accomplished change. Inspiration is not one of them. So maybe we should do some of this as we do better leadership development. So do due do, do diligence on leaders, stop chasing inspiration, understand the pitfalls of trying to learn from rare events and extreme examples. And next, teach people power skills. So I tell my students in my class, you're going to go through the stages. The first stage is going to be denial. Then you're going to be angry, mostly at me. Then you'll be sad. Finally, you will accept. This is a book on power. And it's true, on the first day, most of them deny, and then they, then they get angry at me, which is fine. And then they finally get sad about the world the way the world is. And then I say, the world is the way it is. If you want to be sad, be sad about many things, not that. And then finally, if they're lucky, they, they find, find acceptance. The biggest confusion is, however, between, the biggest problem may be the confusion between what should be and what is. 
in the leadership domain, the discrepancy between how leaders, we would like leaders to behave, leaders, we would like leaders to be authentic, modest, honest, and all these other wonderful things. But if you actually look at leaders, is there much evidence that many or most of these leaders have these traits? And if they don't, why? Why not? Why not? Somebody said to me on November the 8th or 9th of 2016, they said, holy goodness, I had actually written a column in Fortune, uh, on Fortune Online approximately 14 months before that said that Donald Trump, in fact, had, had all the qualities that we say we don't want, that we don't want in leaders, but in fact, select for. In fact, we select for. Not just in the United States screwed up political system, but in companies. We claim we don't want, and I'm going to go through three of them, and then we'll be done. Modesty. Jim Collins and Good to Great highlights level five leaders who are characterized as being exceptionally modest. That's right. Modesty is a virtue. That's right. Modest leaders share credit, which is a great thing to do. Are most leaders modest? Hmm. What do we know about that? Well, we know there's the book, The Productive Martin Narcissist, which talks about many famous leaders. But more than that, I'm not sure what the opposite of modesty is, but let me suggest that one opposite of modesty might be narcissism, and there is a tremendous amount of empirical research on the effect of narcissism on leadership. Narcissism reliably predicts being selected into leadership roles in all kinds of organizations, including, by the way, the military. Narcissism and self-aggrandizement and even unwarranted self-confidence predicts not only are you more likely to get into a leadership role, you're more likely to be promoted. And once in them, oftentimes, you're more likely to hold on to those positions, extract more resources, and even in some instances, helps on some dimensions of job performance. Then we have authenticity. People, it's a true north, which I love, written by my dear friend Peter Sims and Bill George. I'm so nice even though I'm older than God. So naive. I've served on the board with a woman who had worked in Medtronic with Bill George. And True North comes out. I read the book. I say to this friend of mine on the board of this other organization, I said, wow, it must have been amazing to work with Bill George. And she said, why would you say that? I said, didn't you read True North? And she said, oh, yes. <laughs> She said, that's not the Bill George I knew. Oh, that's interesting. Anyway, the idea that people should be true to their real inner selves, in part because others can see through attempts at deception, in part because people prefer to relate to those who share their real feelings and thoughts. But great leaders are great actors. Our ability to uncover deception is quite small, as it turns out. Authenticity may be impossible, as we are affected by the roles we're in and by the situation. Plus, people change all the time, so you should, you should, be, should you be your authentic six-month-old self? In which case, you're, by the way, not using the bathroom. <laughs> should you be your authentic nine-year-old self? Your authentic 18-year-old self? Your authentic 30-year-old self? Your authentic 40-year-old self? We change all the time. And by the way, authenticity is being true to yourself. The people around you don't want to be true to yourself. They want you to be true to what they need from you. I have a friend whose daughter died of a drug overdose. After five months, by the way. It's horrible. Comes to work. After a while, his colleagues, of course, are sympathetic, obviously. But at the end, they want him to provide leadership, energy, they want him to help them do their jobs. As he said to me, losing a daughter is a hole in my heart that I will never get over. But sooner or later, you have to go back to work, regardless of how you feel. Leadership is not being, not, leadership is not being authentic to yourself. Leadership is being true to what the human beings who are looking to you and rely on you want and need from you. They need your energy. If your spouse has walked out on you, if your kid has wrecked a car, doesn't matter. They need you to be present for them. 
Even a couple examples will pass by. Should leaders tell the truth? Ah, George Washington and the cherry tree. America's founding myth. Little George chops down the tree. His father says to him, George, did you chop down the cherry tree? His father, I cannot tell a lie. I did chop down the tree. America's founding story. Turns out, it's not true. The myth of George Washington and the cherry tree was made up by a guy named Mason Weems, Parson Weems, who was writing a book on leadership 40 years after George Washington's death. And he said, we need a good story. Turns out America's founding myth is a lie. Leaders lie all the time. But by the way, the future no consequences. Politicians. Donald Trump, what a fact. Even before Donald Trump, Senator John Kyle in Arizona going to close down the US government because he does not want a continuing budget resolution because it funds Planned Parenthood. We know Planned Parenthood, 90% of Planned Parenthood's money goes to fund abortions. TV shows get word of this. Turns out it's only 3% goes to fund abortions. John Kyle's office issues a statement. Senator Kyle's statement was never intended to be factual. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> Government officials, Mr. James Clapper, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr. Clapper, does the US government spy on individual communications? Absolutely not. Mr. Clapper is called back after Edward Snowden shows that statement to be wrong. Uh, I was trying to say, I was trying to be as close to the truth as possible. <laughs> executives, tobacco industry executives, do you test for the truth, the whole, tell the truth, so help you God, absolutely. Did your organization, did you know your organization had research that shows that tobacco causes, causes cancer? No, we never knew that. Even in high technology, vaporware, which of course is software that isn't quite ready. Reality distortion field, Steve Jobs. What does reality distortion field mean? It means that Steve Jobs made it up. <laughs> Larry Ellison, founder of Oracle. Second, third, fourth, who knows, richest man in the world. In the book, The Silicon Boys, David Kaplan, Ass Ed Oaks, co-founder of Oracle. Does Larry lie? We prefer to say, says Ed Oaks, that Larry has a problem with tenses. As in the software is available means that now you've asked me about it, we'll think about designing it. <laughs> Study done of salespeople. What percentage of salespeople exaggerate the qualities of their product or their competitor's product in the other direction? About 76%. HR, we probably have HR people in the room. Survey of HR executives. If you have people in your organization who are doing just fine, but are not going to be promoted because they're not part of the high potential, do you tell them, by the way, you have no chance of being promoted? 75% of the HR executives. HR executives say, no, we don't tell them. Because of course, as soon as I tell you you have no chance of being promoted, you're going to run for the door. Telling on truths is common, done to smooth over relationships. I've already given an example. People tell distorted negotiations, done to burnish resumes. 40%, according to ADP, of resumes have factual errors on them. 85% of online dating profiles are not 100% accurate, to put it mildly. Done to make companies good to look good to analysts, done to make sales, done to keep supporters even in the face of setbacks, entrepreneurs. I know many people who started companies. Some days, you're going to have a setback. You're not going to know what to do. So you can come into your organization and say, by the way, employees, investors, and customers, we've had this setback, and I'm clueless. <laughs> In which case, they're all going to run for the door. Or you will do what every successful entrepreneur I know does, which is to bluff through it. <laughs> it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. Every, behind every successful entrepreneur is someone who can see how they are going to get through this, even at the, if at that very moment they don't. Because what we know is that when you tell people, sometimes it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy. 
The reality that is originally fabricated becomes true. It can forestall opposition, can smooth over difficult situations, produces the cheater's high, positive affect, and emotion. So, we're still just in time. This is good. Final recommendations. We have disconnects. We have disconnects between what leaders say and what they do. It's interesting to me. I go to these talks. We have these things at Stanford. View from the top. I said, you know, what a stupid thing. We ought to have that view from the bottom. <laughs> you know, by the way, most of you aren't going to stop or start at the top, so why don't we, anyway, the view from the top. These leaders come here to tell you stories. And then I have my students come and say, oh, did you hear this talk? So inspirational. And I say to them, you know, I, what's is astounding to me, it is the sense in which, you know, I wrote a column, and I we used to write columns for Business 2.0 before the magazine folded, in which I had this great insight that, in fact, a lie takes two people. The person who tells the lie and the person who wants to hear it. So these leaders come, and they tell you all these stories. And I say, by the way, did you do a Google search? You know, nothing is private. Some leader comes in and says, I have great relationships with my partners. Where does the leader live? Oh, such and such a city. Let's type in court filings in such and such a city. See how many times his partners have sued him. Now, if you've been sued by your partners approximately 100 times, I'm exaggerating, but not by much, what does this say about your partner relationships? <laughs> it's interesting. We need to cure the disconnect between leaders say between what, and what they do. We need to certainly cure the disconnect between prescriptions for leaders and the reality of actual leader behaviors and traits. We need to cure the disconnect between leader performance and behavior and what happens to those leaders which, of course, in many cases is the absence of consequences. We need to cure the disconnect between what most people, including, I suspect, many of the people in this room want. I want to hear good news. I want to hear nice stories. I want to hear a nice uplift in what you need, which is the truth about how things get done and how to, make, and how to get more effective. And we need to certainly cure the disconnect between how leadership development mostly gets evaluated and the consequences that, that truly matter. So I hope you will take all of this to heart. I don't know if we're supposed to have like one or a quarter of a minute for questions or what we're supposed to do. In any event, it is a pleasure to be with you. I hope to see all of you again. And as you can see, even though I'm old, I'm tough. <laughs> <laughs>